Hello, my name is Jesse Burbank, and I'm a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, and thank you for attending this evening's program. The Dole Student Advisory Board is composed of KU students committed to the work of the Dole Institute. We attend regular meetings, assist in events like this, and plan an SAB-sponsored program every semester. Members of the SAB receive great opportunities to network with our special guests. If you are a member, if, excuse me, if you are a student and would like to join, please contact the Dole Institute. The Dole Institute would like to hear from you. If you enjoy this evening's program, please let us know by contacting us on Facebook, Twitter, or through our website email. Your attendance and feedback help shape future programming. To view past programs, visit our online video archive at www.doleinstitute.org. A video of tonight's presentation will be available on our website soon. Before we begin tonight, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. After the interview, we will have some time for audience questions and answers. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student helper with a microphone will come to you. Please ask just one brief question. <laughs> Finally, if at any time during the program you have difficulty hearing, please alert one of our staff members or student volunteers here in the hall, and they can assist. And now, please welcome Associate Director of the Dole Institute, Dr. Barbara Ballard. Good evening, and thank you, Jesse. And isn't that a wonderful voice? Yes. <laughs> Give a round of applause. <laughs> Please welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics at the University of Kansas, and certainly welcome to an evening with Cindy McCain. But before I do her introduction, I would just like to call your attention to the back of your program and have you noticed that our 2014 study groups are going on. Our attendance at this hour, 4 to 5.30 on Wednesdays, has been unbelievable. And our fellow this year is uh, Mark Sum. Also, our Fort Leavenworth series, please take note of that as well. And we have a program on April the 8th, Double Down, Game Change of 2012. And I'm sure that's a program you will not want to miss. And to continue with our 10th anniversary series, America's Heroes, Medal of Honor recipients from the Civil War of Afghanistan, I hope you will attend that as well. It is our pleasure here at the Dole Institute to welcome Cindy Hensley McCain. She has been active in organizations in the United States, across the world that help people experiencing social and political inequities and associated violence. She has dedicated her life to improving the lives of those less fortunate and to making the world a better place. Cindy founded and ran the American Voluntary Medical Team from 1988 to 1995, which provided emergency medical and surgical care to impoverished children throughout the world. She led 55 medical missions to third world and war-torn countries during the organization for seven years. Some of the other organizations that Cindy has been associated with has been HALO, Operation Smile, CARE, World Food Program, Eastern Congo Initiative, the Olympics, and Special Olympics, dealing with issues such as landmines, disabilities, hunger, human trafficking, abuse of women and children, and global sports for athletes of all kinds. Cindy is also chairman of Hensley and Company, the largest Anheuser-Busch distributor in the nation. Her formal education includes a master's in special education from the University of Southern California, and she is a member of the USC Rosier School of Education Board of Counselors. She resides from the great state of Arizona. We have a great state of Kansas where she lives with her husband, U.S. Senator John McCain. You hear a lot about Senator McCain, and you will hear a lot about all the things that Cindy McCain is doing as well. Together, they have four children. We had the opportunity to meet Cindy this evening, and I will say to you, she's delightful, warm, friendly, 
and a woman who's made a strong impact. She has made a difference in the lives of people, and she will continue to make a difference. Our world always welcomes people who spend their lives giving to other people and making a difference in their lives. I will turn the program now over to Bill Lacey, director of the Dole Institute, and please give a warm welcome to Cindy McCain. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, Cindy, let's start with the first question. Um, tell us a little bit about your upbringing and your education. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I want to thank all of you for coming. Um, I am so honored to be in this building uh, speaking about and from a perspective having known and d knowing the man that this building represents. A true American hero and someone who has been a, a, a real leader in not only political life but in the life of, of compromise and the life of making politics a good place to be instead of a not so good place to be. So I'm very honored to be here. Um, I, uh, I grew up in Arizona. I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona. My dad was, was born there as well. And uh, when John ran for Congress the first time in 1982, I thought, oh, well, do I really have to move? <laughs> I kind of like it out here. It's warm. Um, what I have found, though, in doing this and being with him since uh, we were married in 1980 and we've been in Congress since 1982 was an opportunity I never thought I would ever have. I have had a front row seat to history. I never dreamed I would ever be in a situation like that. And not only have I been, had this front row seat, I have learned a great deal about myself in, in, along the journey that, that has taken me. Uh, this far. So I'm just, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be able to do the things I do and raise my children in, in a way that I think will make them prosperous and giving human beings. You've had just a fascinating uh, life and yeah. have done a lot of things. <laughs> and, you know, you've been a humanitarian, a philanthropist, a businesswoman, a mother. Uh, half of a famous DC power couple, uh, like we were talking about a race car driver, a pilot. How do you juggle all of that? I don't know. <laughs> you know, I was explaining to the students earlier, um, you know, as women, uh, we just do what we have to do. We get the job done. And whether you have uh, no family or whether you have a large family and you have lots going on, you just do what you can do. And my mother always told me, you know, God never gives you more than you can handle. So every time I really thought I was about to go under for the last time, I, I was reminded of her words to me. Um, I love doing it. I love, I love life. I love uh, having the opportunity to, uh, to be a participant in all of this in a small way. And, uh, you know, even on the down days, and, you know, all of us, all of us have down days, uh, I'm always reminded of my husband who had a lot of down days when he was a prisoner of war, and then I don't think I, I don't feel so bad after that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Talk about some of your humanitarian and philanthropic activities. Mm. Well, a lot of people ask me how I got started in, in all of this, and I was a special ed uh, major and a special ed teacher for a number of years. Um, and I really thought that was where I was going to land and going to stay. And I love it. I wish I could do it now. Uh, but, but as you know, for those of you that do it, and I'm sure all of you in this room do, humanitarian action and philanthropic work and, and volunteerism, whatever your label for it is, uh, is very personal to you. It's what moves your heart. It's what moves your mind. It what moves your senses sometimes. And it's no different for me. Um, I wound up having a number of profound experiences through the years with things that occurred in war zones and in uh, uh, various places that were, you know, that I never thought I'd ever be, let alone be there and experience what I did. And I'll use one example in this and why this is really why I do it. Um, I had the fortune or misfortune. Uh, to wind up in Rwanda during the genocide in 1994. 
it was by accident. We had gotten the call to, to join hundreds of other medical teams from around the world to go in and um, help. And we flew into Rwanda, but then realized very quickly we had to get across the border or we were going to die with the rest of them. So we fled across the border and set up uh, to catch you know, the refugees that were coming across. And we were in Zaire, which is now Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo. And I'm a kid, I was a kid from Phoenix. I thought I'd seen a lot. I thought I'd been around the world. But until you, forgive me for being so graphic, until you have smelled death and seen what a, one human being can do to another human being, um, it changed me forever. And so uh, we have a daughter as a result of it. We have, uh, we have, I think together as a couple experienced a great deal and my husband has always encouraged me to just move on. He's, if you're afraid, step into it. Um, if you're not afraid, then you're doing something wrong. <laughs> Take a little bit more time, if you would, please, to share Bridget's, oh, your story and Bridget's yeah. story with, with our audience tonight. Oh, she's, Bridget is our youngest child. She is 22 years old, and she just left the nest. I'm having a hard time with this. I'm saying I'm an empty nester for the first time, and I don't like it one bit. <laughs> uh, but she was, I was working again with our medical team in Bangladesh, and we had, uh, we worked during the week in a cholera clinic. Was, there's a huge hospital in Dhaka that does just cholera work. And on the weekends, well, we were there a month, we were asked to go, my, I have a friend that's Catholic, and she said, look, why don't you, while you're there, why don't you go look for Mother Teresa's orphanage? I'm sure they can use the help. And uh, we did just that. It took us two tries to find it, because it, I don't know if any of you have ever been to Dhaka, but there's a part of it called Old Dhaka. And it is literally a winding trail. And there's no street signs or any of that kind of stuff. So it took us a while to find it. And when we did find it, we walked into her, the lovely, loving hands of these nuns to 150 newborn children that had been dropped off or left. Uh, most of them, all of them, 99% of them were little girls. Because, you know, little girls are disposable in that part of the world. And uh, I worked you know, with them, and, and my daughter picked me. Uh, I, she had a very severe cleft palate. Uh, she had a number of problems. There was another child next to her that was 10 days different in age. She had a heart condition. Anyway, to make a long story short, I realized we had to get them out of there because they were going to die. They, the nuns were doing everything they could, but these kids were sick. And so I did exactly what I look back on now, wonder how the heck I did it. You know, I went in, demanded a, a passport, demanded a visa, to me, you know, all things that I would never dream of doing now. <laughs> and um, uh, we were getting ready to leave the country. I had the two babies, and I had the embassy, our embassy, helping us, and you know, all that. And we were called in by the uh, their Secretary of Health and Human Services, their version of that anyway. And they said, you have to come down with the babies, and I, we're on a time change. You know, there was one flight a week into Dhaka to get us out of there. And so we're, I go down, I hustle down there. I'm looking, you know, I'm just trying to make a plane with these two babies. And uh, these gentlemen, first were talking in Hindi and chattering back and forth. And then one of them looked up at me and said, well, these children have things that we can fix here. We can fix these kids. We can do this. And I slammed my fist on the table, and I said, then do it. And <laughs> they didn't know what to do with me, so they stamped it and stamped it and said, get her out of here, you know. <laughs> get, the, get the crazy blonde lady out of here and send her home. And I, I left with these two babies that needed help. I had a hospital team waiting for me at home, but there was one issue. I hadn't told my husband. <laughs> Minor detail. A minor right? item, yeah. And I stepped off the airplane with, uh, with these two babies, and my husband was there to greet us, which was marvelous in Phoenix. And he kind of leaned down and said, you know, where is she going to go? And I looked, and I said, she's going to our house. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. And he knew better. He knew what was going on. But he is a most gracious man and a most loving man for putting up with that, I have to say. And we've been so much better for it. She's a lovely young lady. That's a great story. Yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah. 
I don't recommend it, by the way, ladies, unless you really are sure of things. <laughs> uh, tell us a little bit about the Halo Trust and your work mm, in that. Yeah. Hey, look, for you, I'm sure most of you remember uh, Princess Diana working on, with a group that took landmines out of the ground. You remember she had a picture with all of it, a very famous photo that was taken. Uh, that's the organization that I'm on the board of, and we remove landmines around the world. And uh, you ask me, why, why do you do that? What's the importance of that? Well, in a society like Cambodia or Sri Lanka or Angola or others, if you can't farm your land or let your animals graze or go to school or cross a road or uh, you know all the things we take for granted or get to the well because the well's been mined, you can't live. You can't raise your families. You can't safely uh, live a life. And so we demine around the world pulling the most heinous items out of the ground uh, that have been left behind. and. Uh, Make, make land and give land back and, and give them a safe life and an opportunity to be able to go to school and, and have a life. It's a, it's, I, there, it's a wonderful organization. I've really enjoyed working with them around the world. I really have. You do a lot of work with uh, women and mm -hmm. children. Why is that so important to you to do personally? Women's rights. Um, it is always the women and the children that are affected first in any controversy, in any um, war, in any, uh, any issue that happens around the world. Women are always the first to be affected by it. They can't eat, they can't feed their families, they can't uh, do all the things that we take for granted. And they're usually running from, from one place to another or one refugee camp to another. Um, it, it, to me, it's basic human rights, and I've seen it at its worst, and I've also seen it at its best. And to me, uh, for me as a human being, I can't, I can't not do it. I don't know what to say. I mean, it's plain and simple. It's no more complicated than that. I just believe that women's rights and human rights around the world are really important and really necessary. Uh, and it stops a lot of conflicts. In the countries in Africa that have either uh, elected women or where women have finally said, enough of this war, enough, we've had enough, uh, pro things are prosperous now. Things are beginning to change. Liberia is fascinating. It's a fascinating story in just this. Uh, but there's a ways to go with human rights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could you just... Uh could you tell us a little bit about participating in the march for the UN, uh, UN's International Women's Day? Mm -hmm. why, why you did it, why that was so important mm -hmm. to you, kind of what it entailed? Yeah, I never thought I'd ever participate in a march. And quite, my mother has passed away, but my mother would have scolded me for that. Um, it, it, was, it wasn't that, though. It was, I appeared in front of the UN that day at a luncheon to talk about human trafficking. And again, Human trafficking, in my opinion, is a human rights issue, a basic human rights issue. And so the group of us that were there, women from across different ways of life, different politics, different around the world, got together and marched from the UN up to a certain spot and then spoke about what we as women can do and what we as women should do and what we need to do, more importantly. And how far we need to go. And so to me, it, it's an important statement. If I'm going to do the things I do, I need to also live it. One of the things that you've also worked a lot on is human trafficking, and yeah. that's part of that. Talk a little bit about your efforts there and why it's so important. And I know we talked before in yeah. my office, and you said that was an issue that was especially significant for you right yeah. now. Um, I didn't realize, I've seen human trafficking in Cambodia, I've seen it in, in India, uh, which I'll tell you a little story about. But I didn't realize that it existed here in the United States. I thought, like so many people, human trafficking was elsewhere. It was in another country. It certainly didn't happen here. This is the United States. Well, as it turns out, we estimate right now that there are 350 to 400,000 children, not 18 and above, children that are being trafficked within the borders of the United States right now. 
Uh, our laws are hit and miss across the country regarding this issue. Um, and I didn't feel that I could necessarily affect change or be respected on this issue if I didn't start at home. And so we've begun a huge campaign, and we're having good luck with it, to change legislation across the country, started in Arizona. Uh, but more importantly, awareness. You have an event like, for instance, the Super Bowl. This, it is a catalyst. It's not the only event. Uh, huge, huge sporting event. Well, guess what? Human trafficking is a big deal. It's, it's a major part of what goes on. That's the other side. Of, of what happens at a, at a fun event like that. Arizona's next up for the Super Bowl. So we've decided, and our governor we had the foresight to appoint a task force. And our legislation has passed both houses and is about to go in, in to be made law and be signed, as, signed into law in Arizona, I'm happy to say. But we need, what now our goal is to work up the rest of the Western Corridor to help the rest of the Western states participate in this as well. Um, you move east of the Mississippi and states are doing pretty good with it, but we out west were not so good. So I'm happy to be a part of that. I'm also happy to, to expose publications like Backpage.com and other online services that think it's okay to sell little girls online, and they do, uh, that it's somehow it's okay for men to be customers of little girls online or not, or uh, and that somehow, oh, it's just boys will be boys. I don't buy that. I don't buy it. And it's, in my opinion, uh, anyone that, that does something like this, especially when it comes to children, they are child abusers, in my, in, in my opinion. I think the opinion of many other people. And also, um, not only the child abusers, but We've, we've decided to make, uh, an, a, make not only this issue well known and for people to be able to understand it and understand that it exists, but also to make sure that those that are caught doing this go to jail for a long time. It's just wrong that somehow we would do this to our children. So uh, that's, that's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> What's... Uh to you, what's the most rewarding aspect of your humanitarian work? Oh, I always get more out of it than I give. I mean, I know those of you who do things that, at home or wherever you choose to do it, you know you, you always gain more than, than, than the people you're trying to help do. Um, it's, it keeps me going, and it keeps me fired up. It keep, every time I see something or I hear something or or maybe something good that's actually happened. It's like, yes, we can, we can keep doing this. It's going to be OK. You know? What's been the most challenging situation that you've found yourself in? And uh, describe it a little bit and mm -hmm. how you dealt with it. Um, I made a mistake one time. I was in <coughs> India, and I was shopping. I were finishing up, and I wanted to buy some sari material for my daughter. And I was in a small, you know, these stores, these little tiny kiosks and things that they have, and I was talking to the man that owned it, and I heard this kind of cluttering underneath the floorboards. You could hear it, you know. And I said to him, I said, oh, is that your family? It would not be unusual for a gentleman's family to be living below the store or something in any of these countries. So I didn't really think much of it. And he said, yeah, that's my family. They're all, you know, my wife and daughters and everything are down there. And we were finishing up, and I heard the cluttering again, and the floorboards were just wide enough where you could kind of see through them, not completely. But what I saw were all these little eyes looking up at me. And what I realized was is that he had a bunch of little girls down there, and he was selling them. And this is some years ago, so the name human trafficking didn't mean anything to me. But the fact that there was something going on that was wrong did. But I walked out of there, and I didn't do anything. I didn't help them. I didn't call anybody. I didn't call the police. I didn't know what to do. And I walked out and went home. And so that's something that I've lived with my entire life now. And uh, it's something that for me, has been a great inspiration because I not only didn't help them, but 
uh, it won't happen again. Now, can you tell us, as a woman, what unique challenges have you faced in dealing with some of these issues? Well, being a blonde woman in Africa, <laughs> you want it alphabetically or in order of importance, <laughs> um, uh, it, it's not always easy to gain the respect of governments um, in you know, the areas that I work in. It's not always easy to gain the respect and the, the understanding of people on our end uh, trying to tell people what we're doing and why we do it and all these things. Um, what I've turned into is, quite frankly, is a very tenacious woman <laughs> and one that I won't give up. And so, to me, it's so frustrating to have somebody look at me and say, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay, what's, what's on TV kind of thing. And I'm not speaking of anything in general other than, it, I'm sure some of you that have worked or do work uh, in a place like Africa particularly, um, uh, a lot of our politicians and a lot of our people in charge kind of have the, their eyes glaze over when you start talking about it because we're so overwhelmed by a place like Africa and you feel like you can't do anything uh, there, and I disagree with that. So it's, it's things that I've learned to deal with and also that I've learned from, which are really important to okay. me. And I hope I teach my children a little bit anyway. Let me shift gears for a, for a few minutes, go to a, a, a different topic. And Barbara mentioned in your introduction, actually these are my words, not Barbara's, that your family business has sold a lot of beer in its yeah, time. Yeah, we have. And um, tell <laughs> yeah. us a little bit about the history of the Hensley Beverage mm -hmm. Company mm -hmm. um, and what different roles you've played yeah. in the business, because you've had a number. Yeah. Um, I'm an only child. I was an only child. And uh, my father was a, a World War II guy, flew a B-17, came home from the war, and said, now what do I do? And he wound up. Uh, in a fortunate position where he acquired the Anheuser-Busch line. Uh, he had to scrape together, scrape it together. He acquired it for $10,000. And he and my mother sold everything they had. They sold cars, house, I mean everything. They sold everything to scrape together that money. And he was always the kind of guy that the most important thing to him had always been his service in World War II, not his accomplishments later on. Um, but I was an only child. And so I knew the day would come that I would be not only play an important role in the company, but be, but be the decision maker. And uh, I wasn't ready for it though, because I really I really relied on my dad for so much. So I had to learn another. Ladies, I don't know uh, any, if any of you have been through this, but I had to learn another another little bit about myself because a, a, women, a woman in the beer business is kind of, kind of an anomaly, to be honest with you. Uh, but it was, it's a good business and it was a good family business. He provided us with a great living. So what I had to do was learn how to deal in the business world, which I had never done before when my father passed away, and, uh, and also gain the respect of beer guys you know, around the world, I'll be honest with you. It was not always easy. Um, uh, it's been um, really interesting. And like everything, businesses, uh, you know, you learn a business, that you, I gain more than it does because I learn so much about myself and about what it takes to, to make a payroll and make sure that my employees are well cared for too. What are some of the roles that you've had with the company? I know you're chairman today, but yeah. you did a, a, a couple other things. I too. did. I was, uh, my dad brought me in early on doing, you know, in high school, you know, I got to do the reclamation part, you know, take the cans in and shovel them. Uh, but uh, after high school, I went in and, and uh, in, a, in a different kind of role, marketing, which I learned a great deal about. I never drove a truck, though. My father never did think I could do that. <laughs> Which is probably, he's probably right, actually. But uh, I did marketing. I did um, a great deal of, you know, on-premise promotions, you know, off-premise promotions, working with uh, the large corporations that buy in Arizona, people like Costco and Walmart, you know, those kinds of things. I do a little bit of everything and have a great group of people that are with us that have been with us for a long time. 
talk a little bit about how your experiences in the business world um, you know, translate in your humanitarian mm -hmm. work and in some of the other things that you've done. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, I think that my experiences beginning in the business world were what really brought to light, and this may sound strange, but really brought to life to me the, the actual human element for women. Uh, the, the, the difficulty and the good side that women can, you know, can, can, uh, can be a part of. But a, women, I still think, are, are, we're not paid the same. We're not, uh, we're not, uh, not always respected as we should be. I mean, I look at people like Sheryl Sandberg, who has broken the ceiling, but she's a rarity. She's a rare find in all of that. So I, uh, I admire, I love reading biographies about women. Uh, and I love reading, reading strong biographies anyway. But I, uh, I, I learn from women, too. And so it's, it's fun to be, to be around a group of strong ladies. How did you and um, John McCain meet and wind up getting married? <laughs> <laughs> I had a friend that wanted to introduce us, and I wouldn't have any part of that. It was like a blind date deal, and I said, I don't know, no, gross, <laughs> not doing it. And we wound up meeting anyway, and I think that was kind of a plot anyway, but I didn't pick it up, pick up on it until later on. But um, I met him in Hawaii. He was at that time still in the Navy, and he was escorting a group of senators on their way through Hawaii, on their way to China. And it um, didn't take long. We were married not too long after that. <laughs> he was very handsome in his dress white. So. <laughs> what is being on uh, the presidential campaign trail like? Mm, drinking from a fire hose. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's, again, it's, it's fascinating because you are a part of, of American progress and American politics that very few people get to participate in, legitimately participate in as a legitimate candidate. So for me, it was, it was fascinating from that respect. It's also grueling, understandable. But nowadays, with all the social media and things that go on, I also think that it's um, cruel at times. It's, uh, I think we've lost a lot of our decorum. I'd like, to, I'd like to see people go back to being respectful in a debate and not harsh and mean. Uh, but I'll tell you, it, I can, I'm now far enough away from it, I can look back and say, yeah, I had a great time. You know, two years ago, if you'd asked me, I would have said no. But, <laughs> but I'm in a much better place with it now. And I, I really enjoyed watching the crowds respond to my husband and respond to his, just who he is and what he's all about and what he offered to the country. So for me, it was quite rewarding to be able to, to be a part of it with him. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What was your average day on the campaign trail like? Uh, Just describe it from morning mm -hmm. to evening, because I don't, I, right. I don't, until you've done it, I don't <laughs> yeah, think totally. most people can really believe how crazy it is. Well, it's a, it's a 12 to 18 hour day, depending on where you are. And it begins with morning briefing of some kind, news of the day, news of the morning, what's going on, who's, who's after us now kind of thing. <laughs> how mean were they last night in the news kind of thing. Uh, and then, of course, we hit the road, whatever the morning event was. There were usually, as we got further into the race, there, were, there was a morning rally or something, group anyway, large group thing, where John would, would speak and we'd uh, kind of fire up the troops a little bit. And then there'd usually be a luncheon of some kind, I mean, a big, you know, kind of thing, followed by an afternoon rally and then a, a dinner that night. And the dinner usually uh, had a lot of what we call photo ops, which is a lot of fun, but it's a photo line that goes like a thousand people, you know, kind of thing in a line. So it was, they were full days. They were, they were fun though. You know, you got to meet so many people from across the country. And, um, and just, I mean, I, I saw parts of this country I never thought I would. And it's all good. <laughs> but uh, it's also, you know, it can be a little tough. I was telling a little story inside about, <coughs> You know, we would we had internet on the airplane, but it wasn't quite as prolific as it is now. And uh, I watched two TV reporters in, talking on the airplane. They were in the back of the airplane, just talking to each other. We landed. They go live almost immediately as soon as they land. And 
I looked and I could see it because we were still on the bus. I could see it on the TV. And the one was saying, well, an unnamed source on the McCain campaign said this, this, and this. It was the reporter he had just talked to. I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I mean, I, I mean I, when I just when I thought I'd seen it all, that was what I, I couldn't believe it anyway. But it was, it was a lot of fun. It was um, an incredible experience, and I would never do it again. <laughs> What uh, you, we talked, we've talked about, we've really gone through this very fast tonight. So I hope that some of you, when you, when we get to Q and A, which will be very shortly here, will will ask about some of the more specifics because uh, I wanted to cover a lot of ground and everything yeah, that you've yeah, done. Thank you. But um, this is the question I have, and and I ask it of a lot of people like yourself. Where do you get the energy and the drive to do everything that you do and to accomplish everything you accomplish? Well, you know, when you like doing it, when you love doing anything, it's not an issue of energy. It's, it's just you love doing it, so you, it doesn't stop you. Um, uh, there, you know, not every day is great. I mean, I'm normal like all of you. Not every day is fabulous. Uh, but it, uh, it energizes me to do the things that I do. And so on the days that aren't so good, uh, I remember what this is all about and why we're here. And so the, ener the energy was never an issue. It was... For me, uh, and plus being able to watch my husband shine the way he did, and the way he was, you know, to me, I mean, of course, I know I'm biased, but I mean, I, I just thought he was just marvelous. And so that meant a lot to me, too, and that energized me, too. And it was important for me to keep on a good face, have a good face on, because there were days that he didn't have good days. And so it was important for me to be uh, the one that was maybe a little up that day and a little more. Um, little more centered with it with it all so okay it's a team effort it really is <laughs> well I only have one more question tonight uh, at least one more on my list that I'm gonna ask I always reserve the right to ask another no, one but we'll do. open it up to your Q&A in just a moment uh, but I wanted to kind of conclude with asking for your advice especially for students and especially women students here mm -hmm. who are here tonight what should they do um, to get involved in public service and how important is it to have them take a greater role in their communities mm -hmm. and in their country? Mm -hmm. I can't tell the young people in this room how important it is that you get involved. Um, and I will also say that if somebody came to me right now and said, should I run for Congress or should I run for public office, I might tell you no, but for this reason, because it is, it, it, as, as I just mentioned, it is a, a rough go right now. People are not civil to each other. They're not willing to debate in a, in a fashion that is, uh, is in, in intelligent and thoughtful. Uh, but we need young people. We need you. You, uh, you are the, with, and I'm not talking about agreeing with you. We need you. We need your debate. We need your influence. We need your input. Um, and it is absolutely the most honorable job you can ever do. So I always say, uh, whether it's your first job or your last job or wherever it comes in your life, public service is the most honorable thing you will ever do. And it's important. And so uh, even though it's a little tough to do sometimes, do it. Okay. Let's get to some uh, questions from you. Uh, you know, uh, we do questions at all of our programs, so uh, every, anybody wants to ask a question, raise your hand, get the attention of one of our students. And we're, we'll start at the back in just a second, just a <laughs> second. Uh, I would ask that you keep your questions to Mrs. McCain's career, and, and uh, you know, if you want to ask, if you have to ask a question about contemporary politics, that's okay. That's okay. But uh, we're really here to learn more about her career to the extent we can. We'll start in the very back. Um, thank you. Uh, what was your relationship with Governor Palin like on the campaign trail? <laughs> I had a great relationship with her. Um, she is a, a very smart lady. She is very, she's also very thoughtful. Um, I, I traveled with her quite a bit, and both she and Todd both. I have a great relationship with Todd. Uh, I enjoyed being around them. Uh, I think she was given a very raw deal. Uh, I've never seen the kind of uh, media 
lashing. No one's taken that kind of lashing. And rightly or wrongly, whether you agreed or disagreed with her, she was treated unfairly. And, uh, and as a woman, I take great offense at how they treated her. Okay. I have a question right here. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mrs. McCain, I understand um, that you had a stroke. I did. Um, would you mind talking about that experience? No, I don't mind a bit. I did have a stroke. Um, I had a stroke in 19, let's see, no, 2004. I had to think for a second. <laughs> stroke does that to you, too. <laughs> uh, it was 2004. I had um, high blood pressure. I was on medication, but I hadn't taken it because I thought, eh. I know better. I can eat right. I can exercise. I'll be okay. I don't need to take the drugs. And the next thing I know, I had a full bleed and uh, collapsed from it. So I learned a very harsh lesson. Uh, I was about six months getting back. Uh, my, I couldn't walk. I, I lost part of my hand, you know, all the speech, all the stuff that occurs from it. But I was luckier than most. Uh, so I. I now take it regularly, and any of you who think you can outsmart the doctor, don't. <laughs> Listen to what they tell you, because I didn't, and I learned the lesson. <laughs> Thanks for asking that, actually. Okay, we have a question right here. Okay, uh, I guess I, the very first question was actually my question, so I had sure. to switch gears a Go little ahead. bit. I guess describe, uh, you know, how things might have been different with a John McCain presidency, especially with the world today, in particular, Ukraine and Russia, and uh, Putin, if you had any comments on that that you'd like to, maybe you've had a little pillow talk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. You know, um, there's something to be said for experience. You know, when you interview people for jobs, you're looking for their experience in the job. Now, I will not sit here and tell you that, I, and talk down about our president. I don't do that, but I will tell you, uh, my husband had more experience, and especially on these issues, and it's playing out now. All the things that he said were going to play out are playing out. And as you remember, Governor Romney had said the same thing to him with regards to Russia. Um, if my husband, you know, I, I, I worry because I have two sons in the military, and I'm no different than any other mother. I watched one son go to combat. Um, I want a safe country. I want a safe world, and I just don't feel safe right now. And that's what I, what I, why I wish my husband would have been in. Okay, we have a, we have a question here. Hi. Um, Hi. There's a certain group down the road that's picketing because of the support you've given to gay rights. Oh. So, do you have anything to say about that or to them? Uh, you know, I love the debate. I love the fact that we live in a country where we can disagree and we can practice free speech uh, by picketing me. But I, again, I felt like it was a human rights issue. I felt like it was time. Um, I, I, and I would do it again. And I did that. I, I, the, the issue was made, aware, made me aware. The, the understanding, I should say, of the issue was brought to me from my daughter. And I don't know if any of you know my daughter's Megan McCain, and she uh, drives her father crazy sometimes. <laughs> but she's very vocal on those issues, and I'm grateful that she uh, made me not only aware of what was going on, but aware of the indifferences and things. And so uh, what I would say to them, uh, honestly, is I disagree with you, and uh, let's have a debate instead of... Picketing. Yeah. But, hey. but, but you know something? We live in a country where you can pick it freely, and that's good. They've also, as everybody knows, picketed a lot of military funerals, yeah. which is a question yeah. back to you. Good evening, Mrs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good evening, Mrs. McCain. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Uh, I actually was going to originally ask you about bipartisanship and elevating the level of discourse. Yeah. So you, you beat me to the punch on that. So if you don't mind, and if everyone else does not mind, I would just like to say thank you for saying that. Thank you for your thoughts on that. Thank you for your service as well as the service of your husband. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you're, you're very kind to say that. Um, I, I worry about our, our younger children looking, you know, they're all online, they're all on TV, and seeing our adult members of Congress misbehaving like that and, and being disrespectful to each other. Uh, I just, 
it has to stop. It has to stop. And it, no one's more frustrated about that than my husband uh, because he's one of the few people I believe that really does reach across the aisle and work together. Okay, can we go to the back? Yes, ma'am. This is a Megan follow-up question. Oh, good. <laughs> I have a very dear friend in Scottsdale who taught Megan in grade school. Oh, my. Is and she behaving herself? <laughs> <laughs> and she loaned me her copy of Megan's book, Dirty Sexy Politics, mm -hmm. her signed copy oh, good. of Megan's book, and I thoroughly enjoyed reading it. Good. But I got the impression that Megan might have been a little bit challenging on the campaign trail. <laughs> As a mother, how did you handle this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a really good question. You know, Megan was, my daughter went to Columbia University. So she went from this bastion of conservatism out west right into Manhattan, you know, in the middle. But it was good for her because she, she was able to learn a great deal about herself. She was challenging, but she challenged the norm. I mean, she, she was the one that asked the tough questions sometimes and wanted to know what was going on and, and, you know, and challenged the staff on a lot of this stuff. As I look back on it, I'm, I know the staff would pro <laughs> probably still doesn't, thought it was a handful, but she was, you know, I, I raised her to be nothing but challenging and thoughtful and, and uh, someone to make change. I, I, that was the kind of daughter I wanted, and I got it, <laughs> I'm happy to say. <laughs> and I hope the teacher, yeah, I can't remember. She only got, she was only in detention a couple of times, so I think it was okay. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for coming. I think this is one of the wonderful things Bob Dole did when he established the Institute. I agree. That we would get wonderful people oh. of all views coming in, and Thank Bill you. has done such a wonderful Thank job. You. He told me to say that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> did he pay I, much? I, I'll get you, Scotty. I know where you live. <laughs> I am very concerned about the women of Afghanistan. Yes, yes. I know um, Mary Jo Myers and Jen Leno's wife mm -hmm. have worked hard mm -hmm. and thought they had them well on the way of being educated yeah. and things. Yeah. What do you think will happen eventually then now to the women after we pull out? I know. I don't have, I don't have much hope. I'll be honest with you. Right now, they're being pulled out of schools, and it, we're, we're slipping back into what they were before, which they were unable to, little girls were unable to be educated at all. And uh, I don't know how we stop that. I mean, I, I, I'm, I, I wish, you know, I wish I lived in Disneyland and this would all be okay, but um, I'm not hopeful about Afghanistan at all for, with regards to women. And other things too, but particularly women, women and women's rights, and things that that um, really make a difference in a country. Yeah. Education. Education. Yeah. Okay, got a question right here. Yes, sir. Uh, Cindy. Another Anheuser Busch wholesaler. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, can you talk about the stress of a presidential debate, mm -hmm. not only for the oh, senator that's but a for great you? One. <laughs> yeah, the debates were were always a little interesting because. Um, at the lack of, I have no other way to explain to you what they're like. So I'll do it the best I can, and please take this for what it's worth. It's campaign humor. Uh, but d debates, and I'm talking about, uh, well, both sides either. It doesn't matter whether you're all Republican or Republican and Democrat. But it's a bit like, you know, when you put dogs into the same pen and they kind of sniff each other for a while, and then they, <laughs> and then they, uh, you know, and then they decide whether they like each other, and then the fight starts, kind of thing. Um, it, debates are very stressful, and they're more stressful, I think. Well, they're very stressful for the candidate, but they are very stressful for the spouses too, because um, I can't, I couldn't say anything. You know, my husband could fight back, but I couldn't say anything. And really, what I wanted to do sometimes was stand up and, and yell. But I couldn't. Uh, so there, the stress level is, is difficult. But remember, uh, no one drafted us to do this. Uh, this is, we volunteered to do it. And uh, you know it's, it's where we want it to be. So you take the good with the bad on that. So yeah, it's stressful, but you know, you'll live through it. 
Hey, do we have uh, other questions? Have, still have some time if you want to ask a question. We have, uh, we have someone right here, Caitlin, and Allison, we'll go back to you. Um, in human trafficking, uh, exactly what is, is your part? I mean, what, what can mm -hmm. you do mm -hmm. and who do you work with? Right, uh, the McCain Institute, which we founded a, several years ago now, is funds research projects right now. Uh, my portion of this has been on the legislative side. I'm not a legislator and I'm not a lobbyist. And I had never done that before, but we needed some laws in Arizona. We had nothing on the books. We had nothing. It, was, it wasn't even addressed in any way, shape, or form. So we had to start from ground zero. And so what I, what I did personally was lobby our governor to put together a task force, which she did. I co-chaired it with another gentleman who was a director of Homeland Security. And from there, we put together recommendations. She took them. They were enacted. They, like I said, we are down right now to the end. We're going to gonna be done, have a, have a law really quick, actually. And that's the first time I've ever done that. And let me tell you, working with legislators is hard. <laughs> it's hard. But, um, and now, we're, like I said, we're going to work with other states on this. We have some federal legislation that's pending. We have some great senators and congressmen that are very devoted to this issue. So the country is beginning to stand up and take notice and stand up and, and, and stop this, stop this scourge. Um, I've, I've, you know, we have a First Amendment issue with Backpage.com because Backpage.com hides behind the First Amendment and says, you know, this is freedom of speech. I think when you're selling children online, I don't see that as freedom of speech. But, uh, you know, uh, I'm not a lawyer either, so uh, that's a whole other issue, though, that we have to, and the federal government's going to get into that one with them. Okay. I have a question here. Yes, sir. Uh, you had mentioned about a mistake that you had made long back when you were in India. Mm -hmm. uh, so looking back to that, mm -hmm. what would you like tell a common man or mm -hmm. an individual to like react to a situation like a child labor or a female mm -hmm. feticide mm -hmm. in societies where there need not be a responsive authority for that? Well, what I tell people here is to trust your gut. If you think there's something wrong, then there's something wrong. And, and don't necessarily, you don't do anything about it, but report it. Go to find somebody that is in charge and that has the ability to do it. In countries where things are being overlooked and, and or ignored, um, My role has been to address the governments of those countries, but truly what makes a difference are the women. When the women start, start realizing that they can be effective in this and that they can not only be effective in change, but that their voice is important in this. So I address a lot of what I do towards the women and make, empowering them to, to begin to stand up and say, don't, you know, we can't, we're not going to tolerate this, period. Leave our children alone kind of thing. I wanted to, uh, and we'll get to some more questions if there are questions from the audience, but I wanted to ask you, you've referenced the McCain Institute a couple times tonight. Can you yeah. talk a little bit more about uh, where the idea came from and, yeah. and the mission and kind of your hopes and the senator's mm -hmm. hopes for the institute? Well, we put something together and we wanted it. Like I said, I'm going home with pictures of this glorious building. My, our fundraisers are going to kill me. <laughs> but this is just spectacular. But our intent was to have a place that represented both of us in what we believe and, and how we've lived our lives and how we tried to be, tried to make a difference. And so my husband, on my husband's side, we focus on next generation leaders. We bring young people that are kind of mid-career in from around the world. Uh, they work. Uh, around the country in their specific areas, be it medicine, journalism, whatever it may be. And then we put them together periodically as a group to then experience, you know, we may go to, they may be on the Hill, we may take them to New York, we may take them to the UN, you know, it just, we give them a, a, a great opportunity to, to, to experience and see and question and be a part of uh, what goes on here in the United States. Uh, and so we're grooming leaders, good leaders that, that uh, not, it's not about agreeing or disagreeing, it's about grooming strong people that will do the right thing. Um, and then my side of it is the humanitarian side. And so our f first issue that we took up in a major way was human trafficking. 
I work, uh, work in Congo as well, as I mentioned, but, but human trafficking is our big issue, and we had some successes. Great. In it, so, and we're, we're very young, though. <laughs> All right. So you come from, you're an only child, and you come from a background with a family that has a successful business. Mm -hmm. What gave you the impetus to go into humanitarian work mm -hmm. and put yourself in these dangerous situations? I don't know. I just knew it was the right thing. I'm re I'll be honest with you. I don't know. I, I can say something lofty, but the truth is I don't know where it came from. I just knew I had to do it. And, I, and the more I did it, the more I wanted to do it, and the more I learned from it. And I'm now in a position in life that I can talk to groups like this and talk about issues that are important and that we need to make a change in. So um, I, tell, I tell young groups, groups of young people, to follow your heart and follow your gut on these things because it'll take you the right direction and it'll also uh, lead to places you never thought you'd ever go. And that's certainly the case in my, in my life. Okay, we have another question right here. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for coming here, and I really lo oh, look up to all your work. Me. <laughs> um, I was just curious about how you started the Eastern Congo Initiative, mm -hmm. and if you could talk about the challenges in starting something like that and mm -hmm. what you guys do there. Mm -hmm. um, politics makes, makes strange bedfellows. That's an understatement, right? I work with Ben Affleck, and mind you, he, he and I politically could not be further apart. But, but on this issue, we see eye to eye, and we see eye to eye in that what we're trying to do in Congo is not go in and save the day. We can't do that. But to go in and empower Africans so that they can help Africans. So it's Africans helping Africans. Uh, we give small grants to, for instance, we just funded it for, in a very small way, a student-run media outlet. And as it turned out during the last elections, it was the only radio station that was still able to broadcast, number one, and had the right, and was telling the truth. So uh, we were so proud of that. You know, um, it, it just, he and I, he called, I'll tell you, he called me uh, a couple of years ago, two, three years ago now, and said, hi, Cindy, this is Ben Affleck on the phone. And I said, okay, Jimmy, my son. So, okay, now what's <laughs> going on? What are you up to? What's I didn't believe it was him on the phone. And he said, no, no, I really want, I want to work with you on this. And so uh, together with the help of plenty of other people, we've been able to, to empower women, to empower. Uh, the rape issue is a huge issue in Congo. It's devastating, and it's devastating a generation of women and girls. And so that's, together, we're working very hard on those issues, and it makes a difference. And where is Colin? Where are you? Where did, I, did I miss you? Do I have your name? Tell right. me. I got, okay, this is the brother of the young woman who is as blonde as he is and as lovely as he is, and she is our ground operative in Congo. So that, she is a, Harper is her name. She is a remarkable young woman and uh, another example of what great young people can do. Okay, we have another question here. Yes. Yes, sir. Thanks for coming again. Thank you. Um, you said it, it's been fantastic to have a front row seat uh, to history mm -hmm. over the last three decades. Yeah. I was just wondering what were some of your favorite moments? Oh, Good gosh. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, there's been a lot of them. Um, my first State of the Union when Ronald Reagan spoke. I, it's something, you know, I had the things you never forget. Um, just to be in the building and to be with, with a man that I revered and do revere. Uh, it was remarkable to be there. Um, obviously, my husband being elected, that's a big deal. That was a big deal because we didn't think we could win. So <laughs> the first time I'm talking about. Um, uh, and also, being able to work with and meet people like Bob Dole. I mean, talk about leaders and, and his, history. Uh, you know, historical folks that, that have not only made a difference, but continue to make a difference by what they have done. Um, I never, it never ceases to amaze me what I get to experience and what I get to see. And those, there's a lot of other things too. I mean, I I've really have had a very lovely life and a very great opportunity to, to see a lot of things. I'm very fortunate. 
Okay, I think we're going to take one last question unless somebody else raises their hand real fast. I yes, just, oh, we, oh, I, we'll take two. Uh -huh. I was just wondering what happened to the second little girl that you brought back. Yeah, she's, she is with another family. They were unable to have children. And as soon as I came home, they said, we'll take her. We're very close friends with them. The two girls have grown up together. They still, they're as close as two twins. They're not twins, but they're as close as two twins. And uh, we've had, they've, they're good friends. And they drive me crazy sometimes, too. <laughs> yes, okay, you want Sir, wanted. you get your final, final question of the night. All right. Um, being part of a power couple as you are and holding that position of influence, I'm curious if you ran into any ethical conflicts in terms of support for your spouse versus support for a particular policy that you might have a conflict on and how you've approached that um, with that position. Well, I tell, he and I have differed on a few issues. Um, we have both learned from each other on this, but we have differed. Uh, but always remembering that my husband is the elected official, not me. My opinions may matter to some, may not matter to others, but uh, the, in, in the end, the bottom line is I support him and what he does, and although we, do, we have disagreed, uh, we do it in a, in, a, in a nice way, and I like to hear him to hear my opinions, and of course he tells me his. Uh, it's, um, it's been interesting, it's been fun. But uh, he's, the, he's the elected official, not me. And I've just had a great time being able to tag along. I've hung under the bumper of the Jeep. That's what I've done <laughs> through these years. It's been a lot of fun. Listen, I would like to say before we go to, um, uh, I appreciate your questions about my husband, not just me, but about my husband and about things going on. Uh, like I said, I think he's marvelous. I think he's an American hero. I think the things that he has done and still will do are, are the kinds of things that he looked to Bob Dole to help, you know, help him understand and do. Um, so I, I know that if he feels like he could measure up to Bob Dole in any small way, that he would feel like he'd been successful in life. So I want to thank you for all of your uh, interest. Those of you who are politically active, thank you. Um, if you're not politically active, get active. <laughs> um, and, and more importantly, thank, just thank you for being a part of, of the process and a part of what goes on here at, at KU and, and with the Dole Institute. This is a, a, not only a worthwhile arena to be in, but it's something that uh, you can make a difference in. And thank you for listening to me. <laughs> and, and thank you for such a delightful program. Oh, we so you. appreciate thank it. You. fever. I'm sorry. <laughs> My nose is running. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you all for coming out. We really appreciate it. And I don't, does one of the students here know when our SAB program is? Is that the second? The second. Uh, next week, the second, right? SAB program is going to be on paying college athletes, pro and con. It's the program that's put on by the Student Advisory Board every semester. You want to be here and hear what the two sides have to say on that issue. You know, Thank you I, all. I forgot to mention something. There's someone in the audience, I know all of you know her, Brooke Yoder, where are you, honey? Stand up. Is she here? Did she have to leave? Did she left? Oh, well, Congressman Yoder's wife was here, and she started out on my side of the campaign. So we had all blondes except for Brooke. We loved having her. <laughs> it was great fun. Anyway, thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>